The Innovators Network. Welcome to the Killer Innovation Show, the longest continuously produced podcast in history. Each week, Phil McKinney brings you the insights and strategies to amplify your creativity and innovation skills. Here's your host, Phil McKinney. Welcome to the bus. We are still here in Richardson having a great time engaging with the local community, civic leaders, uh, performers, creatives, innovators, financiers, all what it takes to bring innovation to the forefront. Today's interview, though, is a little bit different. We uh, had a conversation with Merrick Porchito. She runs Artist Uprising. Now, if you're not familiar with Artist Uprising, they are a company that plays kind of this middle ground between brands such as Nike and creative artists. Could be musicians, muralists, any on the on the creative side, and plays kind of that translation role, right? It helps understand the information that an artist needs to go create something really compelling, yet not get all tangled up in the uh, corporate uh, world of uh, corporate speak. And, uh, you know, she's had some pretty big impacts here in Richardson. She's actually working on a number of, of artist installations and programs here in Richardson, which she talks about in the interview. But she also talks about the issues of branding and storytelling and how to create compelling experiences and um, the role. We do spend a little bit of time, actually not a little, a fair amount of time, talking about NFT. So if you're not familiar with NFT, you're definitely going to want to listen uh, about that and how she got involved in that and what she thinks that could have as far as an impact on uh, the, the way uh, artists are compensated, how art is distributed, how art is owned, how art is resold. And so you definitely want to check that out. This was, again, not what I would say would be a traditional uh, type of a guest we've had on Killer Innovations. And it's a real eye-opener, and I'm thinking we will have more guests like this because it offers a completely different view, particularly when it comes to creatives. And look, if you're listening to this show and you're highly innovative and highly creative, you are a creative. And the question gets down to is how are you going to make money? How do you do what really drives you? Whether you're a photographer or a a painter or sculptor, whatever it is, this is the show for you. You want to make sure you listen to this entire show and really glean the expertise that Merrick has for you. So without any further ado, we're going to jump into this week's episode. But before we do that, Got a favor to ask, like, share, and follow, like this episode, share it with others who you think would benefit, and follow us on social media. With that, let's jump into this week's episode. This episode is sponsored by Zoom. With Zoom, you can streamline your communication, collaboration, and creativity all in one place. Zoom is the market-leading platform that provides video meetings, voice, webinars, and chat across desktops, phones, tablets, and conference room systems. To learn more about Zoom and sign up for your free account, visit KillerInnovations.com slash Zoom. So, Mary, give us a little bit of background on uh, the Artist Uprising. It's your company. Yeah. You mm-hmm. uh, obviously are very focused on the creative side of uh, of uh, the marketplace. So give us a little context of uh, the Artist Uprising and some of the things you've been doing recently. Yeah, yeah. So um, Artist Uprising is basically kind of a... I would say, for lack of a better word, we're the handshake between creatives of all different types and large brands and companies, Um, sometimes even cities or, you know, commercial developments, things like that. But um, essentially what we do is we help kind of connect and curate the right type of talent with, um, you know, these large corporations, brands, whatever. Um, And it's usually, honestly, my whole company started on one question which was when I would sit down with with businessmen and women, I'd say, what's your creative need that you have right now? 
Um, and it, and I found that sometimes it was so niche. It was such a specific thing. It wasn't just, oh, I need an agency to do something. It was, I need, I, I have this wall and it needs something awesome on it. And I, and it needs to be custom and it needs to be meaningful and things like that. So we, uh, it will, I say we, at the time it was me. I've done this company for about seven years now. And so I just started curating different artists that I loved and, it started working. And then um, from there, just kind of our mission statement became to abolish the term starving artistry. I'm super passionate about it. I'll talk about that in a second. But um, I was just so tired of artists not getting paid. <laughs> so, um, so you know, really the whole company kind of started from there. And, and honestly, everything has just evolved from that, um, from that space of just really finding work for artists. It's interesting because, you know, a lot of the artists I know, right, they they want to figure out to make that connection. But where they have a skills gap is that connection yes. of how do I take my creative abilities and apply it mm -hmm. to something that a business person or an owner or an entrepreneur would yes. be willing to pay for. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you're trying to play that, that yes. bridging, almost uh, the universal translator between yes. creatives and mm -hmm. uh, the business people. And it is two different languages. Yeah. And, and for whatever reason, I, I really speak both, you know, I guess just a, cause I'm run a company, but also I'm a creator myself. Um, but just to see the, the breakdown in communication between the two. Now it doesn't mean that that's a hundred percent of the time. There's lots of creatives that can, you know, sit down and really communicate to a corporation, you know, what, why their skill set should be utilized. But also on the flip side, the corporate side has a really hard time communicating their needs right you know or they have a hard time communicating um you know a, it's not so literal and an artist sometimes just needs to hear like okay what do you want to achieve you know and um i think sometimes i have to help the, the corporate clients really massage what they actually are saying you know well and i, I can speak on personal experience we opened up our offices in silicon valley in sunnyvale and i've lived in the valley for <clears throat> decades and so we had this entryway into the office building and they, uh, my facilities team is kind of like, well, you know, should we just make the red wall go? I'm like, no. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're talking to a CEO who started off wanting to be an architect. You know, no, mm -hmm. we're not doing just a red wall as soon as you come in, the, you know, when you come into exactly. the lobby. Right. And it turned into trying to convey, because it was my me communicating to my facilities team, then trying to communicate to the the interior architects about what that you know oh my gosh it was like talk yeah. about lost in translation yes yeah it was the chinese phone <laughs> game in spades to play as a kid it, it's funny that you said that because we're i'm literally having that exact conversation we're we're doing something with american airlines right now which is really really cool but they have a wall that you know it's it's like what do we do with this you know and so anyway we just we're looking at all of these different options of, you know, neon installations to fine art installations to something that's more architectural. And I absolutely love it. I love this part of what I do is just to get to present options and see the light and the life come, you know. Out well, of and, that's, and it's interesting because in the corporate world, I mean, I could tell you after we actually did the installation in Sunnyvale and the facilities team saw it, they're like, Oh, mm -hmm. now, uh, you know, yes. it's almost you have to wait till you get to the end and then yes. backtrack the dots. I, and everybody goes, oh, right. OK, now I get it. You it's know? so there's so many times where I'll, I'll sit there and be like, OK, you have to trust me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you just just trust let me. Let go. Yeah. Let me get to the end. And then if you really don't like it, I'll pay you back. You know, that yeah. I, that, that hasn't happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, like in many cases, I would guess this. They are little. I want something that's you know aligns with the brand. Yes. Yep. That's what, what you hear every what day. The heck, you know, what, yeah. What, what does that mean? You know. Um, so talk a little bit about some of the other things. I know you've been pretty active here in the in the Dallas Fort Worth mm -hmm. Richardson area, yeah. specifically around NFT and and that, that being a new emerging space. Yes. You may need to take it just a half a step back and give context here. Yeah. Sure. On NFTs. Yeah, so um, kind of how I got thrown into NFTs, which is exactly what happened. Um, so, you know, 
uh, artist uprising slash myself being an agent, you know, a, an agent of, of brands to creators, we do represent several international uh, graphic designers and artists and whatnot. And so when this whole, you know, rise of the conversation of NFTs happen, I had not caught on yet. I'm just over here doing my own thing, just busy working on my normal, my normal stuff. And uh, in one week, my emails got flooded with these requests coming in for my artists, you know, of, hey, we want to collaborate with so and so on this, you know, new NFT or, hey, you know, we want to we want to pay fifty thousand dollars to this artist for to to make an NFT. And I'm like, OK, this, the people are throwing out, you know, large dollar amounts, um, kind of like candy mm -hmm. all of a sudden. And I was like, what what is this, you know? So I'm over here Googling what NFT is, trying to understand. And uh, and then one of uh, the artists that we actually represent, his name is Magdiel Lopez, but he's also my creative director um, at Artist Uprising. And we own a creative agency called Belmont Together. And so he comes in and I was on the phone and he was just, you know, nervous, just sitting there, just his his legs just, you know, bouncing up and down. And so I get off the call and I was like, what is your problem? <laughs> and he goes, okay, we need to talk about NFTs. And I was like, what is, what is this? You know? And long story short, you know, I get on enough of these zoom calls and I mean, one Republic was wanting to collaborate and, you know, then you have Sprite over here and you have something out in Berlin that had reached out to us and then, you know, something at Pixar. And I'm like, this is crazy. And the more conversations I, I was a part of, the more I thought, uh, it started to make a lot of sense and we can kind of backtrack and talk about that. But I thought for Dallas, we need to bring this to a physical real life scenario to educate people on why this is so awesome um, and why it's a big cultural change agent. You know, and I could see within a week what I'm looking at long term. So we decided to host the first um, NFT pop-up gallery here in Dallas, and uh, we did that, and lo and behold, it was the third one in the country. So we had lots and lots of press over it, and anyway, it was a, it was a really crazy ordeal how quickly that took off, right. you know? Right. So back up, and let's give just a quick definition of what, how do you describe an NFT for somebody who doesn't, who's not, who's not into it, uh, you know? Right. Well, if you Google it, it still won't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> Non-fungible token, I, I still don't get it. But it, the way, in layman's terms, the way that I describe it is, you know, it's it's almost like um, art, art buying and selling or art trading, but there's a ledger. And the fact that it's digital and online, this ledger makes it um, public to everyone. So, you know, this seatbelt sitting next to me. <laughs> is uh you know only valued at what you're going to pay for it so right. if you give me five dollars then that's right. you know what it is but that ledger says you know if i sell a piece of digital art online or if i put it up for an auction and somebody spends five dollars five thousand dollars five million dollars whatever that price point is um then it's now publicly shown almost kind of like the stock market right. you know and um, then that buyer of that work, when they go and they resell it, then there can be a kickback all the way down the chain every single time it resells. And there's a 10% kickback all the way back to the artist. That's not true 100% of the time, but for foundation. And so this kind, of, this kind of solves the problem of artists who become famous many years later or after they've passed on. Yeah. And nobody, the artist gets nothing. They sold it yes. originally for $100 and all exactly. of a sudden it's a $10 million artwork. Yes. And they don't get to participate in that. Correct. And that has just, it's, it's almost like the answer has come for that problem. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was describing in another interview, traditionally, you know, you have your traditional galleries and an artist, you know, right. um, does a commission or they might, you know, sell a piece of work. And then the, the gallery or the agent makes their percent and then it goes on and it can be resold. And again, just like you said, the, the artist never knows who's resold it, resold it, resold it, if that ever even happened. But with this, the artist gets gets that that kickback payment all the way through the many resells that could happen, but so do the former owners of that piece. And so now you have this like, for me, this is so cool because I, I'm, you know, a big advocate for the artist um, in particular to make money, but also I'm a business person. So I'm seeing like, 
this is such a return on a, on investment if you are investing in the right artist. Right. And then as an agent, I'm really excited <laughs> because you get to actually put the right artist at the table and say, okay, to anybody who is interested in participating and investing or even just having fun, you know, play money in this, let's look at what artists can come to the table right now and let's see what they can do in this NFT space. So I've just been kind of look just watching i've been watching a lot i've played a little bit in it and made a little bit of money lost a little bit of money whatever but (laughs) um but i do think that it's cool to see um you know some of these really famous nft artists are they don't really have a following anywhere else they just put their chips in i mean in the early days of nft you you also wondered what was it really around the art or was it around the NFT? Exactly. Right? So, yes. you know, is it the people enamored with the technology saying, I'm going to get in early? Yep. I don't know what this exactly is, but there seems to be a lot of energy. So I'm going to go grab some stuff just as a yep. as a way to play the game. Or is it really around, I really want that art. Piece of art. And because of the way the ledger works, it it basically gives you a, a digital certificate of authenticity. Exactly. Versus you don't have to. You know, is that really a Picasso? Got to take it to yeah. an expert. Got to get them to validate. You don't have to worry about that in, in with a ledger. Right. Yeah. And it, and it is interesting because some of the um, NFTs that so, have sold for so much money are not, they're not aesthetically, I mean, some of them are tweets, <laughs> you know, um, it's just so interesting to watch. But when you do see some that are really, um, the art itself is, um, you know, people are are buying that. I find that interesting because a lot of the times it's animated. It has an animated aspect to it. Um, you know, some some of the artists that have come on board that I've known and and they've participated outside of NFT and crypto world, they're super super famous. And then they come on and they launch their first NFT, and I've seen some of them kind of fall flat. Mm-hmm. And so the question is, why? What is it about that? Is it and and Really, for me, I think, again, I'm no expert from but from what I'm seeing is there is a huge crypto community. And if you can be in the these chat rooms and part of the community and then you come out and you release your NFT and you let them know. I mean, right now, people are really kind of coming around almost like a family, like a crypto family, (laughs) and they want to help promote each other so that the whole overall thing lifts. Um, but <clears throat> you know, so, and so some of those artists that kind of fell flat, I re- I was like, well, are they talking? Like, are they part of this community? And they were not. They were just, well, I just want to try it out, make some money. Right, so I'm just, yeah. Just going to log in. Just going to log I'm, in, I'm, drop I'm it. it. Upload something. I'm, I'm, you know, big on Instagram, so I'm sure it'll be fine, you know? And you're, and, and you're seeing that that's not actually not going to help you. Um, and for right now, I find it kind of awesome that, you know, even in the NFT world, people aren't spending their thousands and thousands of dollars on an NFT based on the followers. Not yet, at least, you know, from what I'm... Well, that, that opens up an interesting conversation, right? Because for creatives, it is about your whatever, whatever you're up, whatever you're producing, whether mm-hmm. it's photography or paint or... Uh, digital graphics whatever it is about um your following yeah right and at least in my experience following in in one platform does not always translate, translate. to the Correct. other place you know whether i'm I'm big on instagram yep. or pinterest or facebook or whatever that it's not like it's one big following Family. you you right. it really depends on where you invest your time Correct. To to reach that, and I think the same applies into the NFT. Sounds like yeah. it's same. The same applies on the NFT world. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know, as more and as more artists are getting involved on the NFT world, you know, you're starting to see those followers going up. But I mean, even just what four months ago for me, you know, some of the ones that were selling the highest may have only had a hundred followers on Foundation or OpenSea or whatever. But <clears throat> but I'm like, you know, a hundred followers. I'm like, what? You know, not, I mean, because I kind of live in the Instagram world a little bit because that's mm-hmm. where we really curate from. So it's really important for us to find artists that we, you know, p- 
pitch to brands that have a following because there's a marketing aspect to that as well. That right. The, so they do if they do something for a brand like correct. Sprite or yeah. American Airlines, it's a you get the you get the art creative side plus you get that yes. following to draw through. It's a yeah, it's a big win. Right. Um, for the corporate so side. We, it, it, so I'm gonna take another another side step here. So. So in your case, you're you're out there trying to find the next artist, mm -hmm. right? And you say, you know, you're living in the Instagram world to find them. What's the characteristic of one that you get excited about? What is it you look for? Yeah, so I really look for um for artists who, if they're on Instagram because it's all visual, um, if they are consistent. That's that's the first thing I'm looking for is what what are they releasing and is what they're releasing consistent. Because a lot of the times I'll see artists like bounce around and I say that that's also myself. I tend to do that a lot. But when what they're posting starts to make sense and it's kind of like, you know, just the rule of familiarity. If you can mm -hmm. just literally throw your finger on a feed and it scroll and you see 16 frames and they're similar enough, the brain says, I, I understand that art. Right. I understand that artist. I understand what yeah. his vision is, what he's trying to convey. Yes. And um, so I look for consistency. I do look for following. Um, it doesn't, I, I have, you know, employed artists that don't have much of a following because I really, I, I know them or I believe in where they're trying to go. Mm -hmm. But um, we consult those artists a lot. So um, to get to that place to where the brands can then understand, okay, yeah, you know, they might only have 5,000 followers, but I, I, they can see within a few frames what they're, what they're getting. Um, so those are kind of our criteria, really. But also, um, I'm big into word of mouth. So I'll ask a mm. lot of artists um, that we are have great success with, not just because of their aesthetic, but because of who they are as people. Right? Are they are they going to show up? <laughs> you know, are they going to? Because um, I can help with all of the back end details. I'm not worried about that. But I need to know that they are going to that that I can count on them. And so when I find an artist that I can count on and that I really, really like working with, I, I always ask them, I'm like, okay, who are other artists that you recommend that are like you, yeah. you know? And, um, of course, then they send me their Instagram handles and we go from there. <laughs> no. Well, it is, it, it's almost like the same thing as a, uh, you know, where I'm at as a CEO. Best employees are referrals. Yeah. You know? Yep. It, you know, it, it cuts out a lot of the... Uh, Digging through the pile to find yes. to find the diamond versus you yeah. know give me at least a diamond in the rough that I can shape. Yeah, it's it's funny. Somebody asked me the other day if um it was can't even remember which city it was for, but they wanted to do um you know a call a call to artists for muralists. They had like thirty mural locations that they wanted to do. So they wanted to do a call to artists, and we were project managing it. And I said, you are absolutely welcome to do the call to artists, but I'm gonna. I'm going to find the connector and the, the, the connection point to some of the best artists in that city first before I like go through a hundred <laughs> submissions, right. you know, and it doesn't mean that we're not going to go through those submissions, but we're really going to ask around first, you know, and that helps. So give us, give me a, a sense of the, the range of projects. We talked about, mm -hmm. you know, murals. Yep. Uh, I know you're doing, you know, some work here in the, the Richardson area, yeah. the city of Richardson. So, I mean, I could just imagine the breath, but yes. walk us through a few samples of the, of yeah. the, of the range of projects you work on. Yeah. So um, sometimes with, uh, you know, for a city, well, I'll just talk about Richardson since we're here, but um, just really looking at um, if there's a redevelopment program going on, we really want to pull in local artists. So we're not going to be pulling in artists from all over to come to a, to a city, whether it's Richardson or Milwaukee or you know wherever we want to highlight the talent within the area so um you know that could look like a lot of the times it looks like murals then I like to take it the next step and do augmented reality murals so we're going to bring in animators at that mm -hmm. point um I tested last year because um we do work with musicians so a lot of the times we'll do live music activations and little you know uh for Richardson we're doing a main street celebration so we'll have festival live music but at other times for companies, it's just, you know, having ongoing musicians show up once a month for happy hours, you know. Right. So but the music scene got hit so hard last year 
that we were like, okay, how can we, you know, art exploded. So we did more murals than we've ever done. We did like 200 something murals last year <laughs> under the guise of construction is essential. So, uh, you know, commercial developers is all we heard from last year. Um, and well, they could get a lot of construction done because there was yeah. nothing else going on. Yeah, nothing else <laughs> going on. So our, we sent muralists, you know, out for those. But um, but for the the musicians, they you know our, our tours stopped, everything stopped for them. And so what we did is we pivoted and we had them record. Um, just I mean, there was so much good music that came out of people's apartments <laughs> last year. Um, but we had them record some really cool sets at home. And um, we implemented them into the augmented side of our murals. So you could go and do an art walk with your phone and hold your phone up to a mural and then hear a, a it wasn't a live concert, but a pre-recorded concert that would pop up on your phone. And you could put your, you know, your ear, earbuds in and listen to uh, local artists. So it was like local layered on top of local. And um, that that gets really fun. And then, you know, on the larger scale, when we're working with the big brands, it can turn into, um, you know, anything from doing a big sculpture, you know, piece for their headquarters. Um, or it could look like having celebrity, you know, musicians and stuff come in and, and do their, their uh, you know, galas or whatever big event that they have. But I really tend to look for a tipping point artists. So artists who do have quite a big following, but they're not the celebrity status yet. And right. that's my, that's my place that I go for. Um, because when you compare, uh, you know, uh, uh, I remember back in, back in a few years ago, it was like Leon Bridges was paired with, uh, with Jameson, I think, or some, some, you know, whiskey company. I remember seeing the the billboard and this is before he won a Grammy, you know, and then he wins a Grammy. And then it's like and I thought, well, look at that brand. I bet is really happy yeah. <laughs> they got him when it wasn't probably well, as that expensive. Was at HP, we did the deal with Sean White. Yes. Before he won the first X. For, yeah. For, we paid for his first van that wow. he threw his bicycle up on and his skateboard on when he traveled around to competitions. Amazing. And then he goes off and he wins the Olympics and he oh. makes corporate appearances. And how fun is that for you? Oh, oh, it's so funny because yeah. then it becomes the story that you tell, you know. And um, so, yeah, we've, we've seen all kinds of crazy, really, really. I mean, artists are, they blow my mind every day. I think I've seen it all. And then all of a sudden I'm like, not, never thought of that. Yeah. You know, and to the fact that um, the other day we were looking up some stuff for American Airlines and. And uh, we ended up finding that I, I was like, I wonder if we could paint a plane. <laughs> I really want to do that. Sure enough, it's been done. You know, somebody just, they, I don't know when it was, but it was. Uh, so they did a wrap? They probably. No, it was actually... a, it was a mural that was painted, painted on the plane for a short period of time for the, um, I, it was maybe a soccer tournament or something. I don't know. I'm not into sports I'm into arts, but. Anyway, something for championship, and it was wow. Because you know, for the, you know, we're sitting here in the bus, and I actually mm -hmm. looked at doing a rap. Yeah. And there's a guy in Denver who's really well known for doing very creative graphics, but he does raps, and he does the raps for, I think it's Frontier Airlines. Cool. So he designs these yeah. raps, and then they go out. And and they wrap the plane, and I'm like, "Holy smoke! Dude. Wow! What is it you cannot wrap?" Right? You know, totally. And uh, you know, but you know, in those cases, it allows you to create not a cookie cutter brand image, but you can actually yes. change the brand image right. to tie in whatever yeah. whatever is going on. Yeah, you know, I see that a lot. With um, it's funny, I, I've done more Nike stuff, and I've never actually talked to Nike. <laughs> You know, it, it's the strangest thing. I've like I've never had a direct uh, conversation with anybody at Nike. It's just these agencies that will contact us, or artists that we work with that will loop us in, and then we get working with the agencies. But I've done more Nike collaborations with artists. Of I mean, it, the other day we did one with a ten year old here in a uh, in Dallas, and she's got yeah, I don't know twenty thirty thousand followers, and she, 
you know, we did a pop-up mural for two months with her that had this, again, augmented reality animation where you scan your phone and then you go into this whole program with Nike and Gianna, you know, it's super cool. And it's like, and I, I, brands are really wanting this stuff. You know, they want to connect with creatives. What's really driving that though? I mean, you see the, do they really understand what they're doing or Mm -hmm. are they just shotgunning to see what works and what kind of a reaction they get? I think both. I've seen both. Um, you know, the ones that are really strategic, those are super fun to see those executed well. Um, we we did one <clears throat> with Canon USA where they were coming out with a, a new printer that prints posters, like, you know, art posters. So they they went on a whole strategic campaign to find graphic, you know, graphic artists. And, um, you know, the way that they promoted that was they would have um, a film crew go in or even an artist kind of film themselves using the printer. So they would just send the printer or whatever. Well, because last year was pandemic and all of that and their film crew couldn't come in. And so our film crew kind of worked with their New York agency um, to we shot it here and um, sent all of the footage there. And then we had the idea to like add in this augmented reality aspect to it. And that commercial was such a cool thing because it was so clear what the product was for but it was about the artist but it so it's like the product was secondary to the artist but because of the way that it was told you wanted that printer you wanted to go buy that well that's interesting because you you, a lot of big brands look hp was fortune six sixth largest company in the world right and you always the, the challenge, or I shouldn't say the challenge, but you always run the risk when you do these kind of times. Sean White or, mm-hmm. or Hamilton, who was the driver or who drove the Indy car for HP in Indianapolis, et cetera, was how do you make it authentic? Yeah. How do you make it authentic with a creative? Yeah. And it's not just, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the, the name, name face, yep. stick, stick it up on the, and, you know, here's a printer and here's the face. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think that's that's the beauty of art. You know, that's the beauty of creativity and innovation and entrepreneurship. You know, it's it's the the ideation phase. Artists live and breathe that every day. And a lot of the times, you know, in the corporate side of things, you can get into so much about systems and procedures and got to get our message out and it's got to be on brand and, you know, things like that. That sometimes when that control comes in, and I, I see that a lot happen too, when the control comes in, it it snuffs out the artist. It snuffs out the spirit of innovation from the artist, and the artist is going to just try to get it done. They're going to just, okay, you know, I just need to get this off. off. <laughs> you know, they, they want so many different revisions, and they want this and that or whatever, that the brands don't understand that if they actually let go and give the artist some, let them do their thing that what they're going to get back is going to be. But that's kind of your yeah. role then, right? Yeah. Because you've got, you've got the corporate. They're mm-hmm. working with their agency. The agencies work with you. Then mm-hmm. you so you're almost what I would refer to crudely as the BS filter <laughs> a little bit between yeah. the, corporate, the corporate guys. <laughs> like, yep. trust me, let go. Uh-huh. Let me work this. And trust me, you're going to be happy when in the end result. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's all, it's, it's educating on on both sides and it is funny because a lot of the times with um you know the corporate side is when they say well you know especially in the beginning i don't hear it much now but in the beginning they'd be like well why should we hire you guys when we can just go straight to the artist you know and i said and plenty of times i said you go do that and then call me yeah knock yourself out yeah go go for that do that one time (laughs) and then call me you know so But it's, it, you know, and it's not, it's not to demean the artist at all. It's just that the, the language is so different. Right. And it's sometimes decoding what the brand is saying. Yep. And then also communicating back, you know, to the artist. Like, I mean, the brand could say 10 things. And I know that the artist needs to hear one or two out of those 10 things to get it. Right. You know, to not overwhelm them and not, you know stress them out <laughs> right and you know and you, you talk about your role in in on the creative side of kind of like i said being being this little bit of this bs filter mm-hmm. in, you know translation translator between the same applies to even internal teams that have like i had design teams industrial design teams yeah. reporting to me the innovation teams as an innovation leader guess what 
you need to play that role. Yeah. You know, you got to be the push back on the corporate side and yeah. let your creatives you know, yes. do their thing do their and thing. translate though effectively. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, for us, I think primarily what we are, you know, we do a lot of curation, but now I think a lot of brands have, they'll find the artists that they want to work with sometimes before they ever come to us. But right now it's like, we're really big in the project management role. So it's like executing and seeing that thing through where we can give our insurance and our, you know, staff and our communication, you know, tools to the brand so that they're not, if, if they're doing a, if they're doing a campaign that is multiple artists, it, you know, a lot of these artists don't have insurance. A lot of these artists don't know how to, you know, handle some of these portals of payment, <laughs> you know? Oh my gosh. Some of them I, I'm even confused on, but you know, I was like, why can't we just send an invoice and get paid? You know? But um, anyway, it's just, sometimes it's, it's gets a little bit more intricate mm -hmm. with some of the larger corporations and these artists would drown in it. Right. You know, and it, because they'd be, they would, be the, they would be spending less time creating well, exactly. and spending more on the administrative, yeah. which no artist wants to spend any time on the administrative. Right. I know. I, I, had one time it was a sculpture deal or whatever, but um, I I realized when it was all said and done, I had gone through my email correspondence with the client. I had 97 emails that would have gone to the artist if it if we hadn't been in, in it. And I thought, I, I just don't even know how artists do this on their own sometimes because right. there's a lot that do. You right. Know, exactly. Lot. Exactly. So as we wrap this up, Merrick, if someone listening to today's show wanted to track what you're up to, mm -hmm. what's the best place? Yeah, they can just go to artistuprising.com or find us on Artist Uprising on any social channel. Great. Easy to Appreciate do. it. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming in yes. and joining us today. And uh, I'm now going to become a uh, fan follower because I love what you're doing. Thanks, thanks. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Now, at the beginning, I told you to make sure you listen to the end. You obviously have listened to the end, so thank you for that. But I think there's a lot of great nuggets in this interview, particularly as a creative, thinking about maybe an alternative approach to how you find that next gig, that next uh, project, uh, a way to think about working with large corporate brands. So check out her site check out her work um she was very very gracious in the interview i got a lot out of it and really appreciate her taking the time to to join us here in the studio on the bus here in richardson and hopefully you found that as beneficial and insightful as i did thank you for joining us uh we do value the time you take to listen the time that you could be doing any number of other things in your day. The fact that you're listening to us, we do greatly appreciate it. Got a favor to ask, let other people know about the show, help me pay it forward. That's my motivation and has been my motivation since 2005 is to pay it forward. Find a way to invest the time and energy into the young engineers, the young architects, the young designers, the young creatives who are looking for those career opportunities that allow them to have a satisfying career and be fairly compensated for the work they do. So we want to pay it forward, and we do that by asking you to let as many people as you know know about the show and help us spread the word. And with that, we appreciate your time. We will be back soon with another episode. Bye-bye. Podcasting nonstop since 2005, this has been the Killer Innovation Show on the Innovators Network. This show is distributed by the Innovators Network. For more information and other great shows and content, visit theinnovators.network.